Hi, I'm Pete Camilleri. I'm the host of the Voodoo Room podcast. And it's now I'm pleased to say that it was our 50th episode with Lionel Cole that you're about to see. And I want to thank every single person who has subscribed and has contributed to the podcast thus far. All the, all the uh, guests, uh, all the people who work in the background. Howard, you've done a great job and I really appreciate all your time and effort. Um, and uh, everybody else who, if I haven't mentioned you, uh, you know you're special and I really appreciate uh, all the uh, effort and um, uh, assistance that you've given me over the past 50 episodes. It's gone really quick, it's been uh, during really some rough times, we've been through COVID and we continue going forward with uh, these sort of dilemmas. However, I want to bring you something really special. Uh, Lionel Cole is a, uh, somebody who I've worked with on a professional level and, uh, and I was pleased to know that he had a similar um, process in his career to what I had in some ways. And that said, don't forget to subscribe, don't forget to hit the like button, don't forget to watch it, uh, share it, no fees, no subscription fees, no Patreon fees, dollar hot dogs, dollar popcorn, Sit back and relax and enjoy and thank you for watching. Here's to the next 50. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to the Voodoo Room, Lionel Cole. What's up? <laughs> Lionel, how are you? I'm great, dude. I'm really great. It's great to see you again, man. Man, it's really good to see you. What was it like playing in Robert Downey's Jr.'s band? Oh, it was just good fun. I mean, it was good fun. Uh, I was playing with my best friend, Cameron Stone. He's like, you know, Yo-Yo Ma is like the best cello player in the classical world. Cameron Stone's probably the most famous cello player in the non-classical world. He's the guy who plays the cello on Game of Thrones and all that kind of stuff, right? And uh, we've been best friends for a billion years. And so we got to do the, the thing together. We got to do the Tonight Show together. It was awesome. Robert's a good guy. He's uh, the only guy outside of me who's got a Chicago police official jacket. My cousin or my godbrother brought him one, you know. So. Wow. And um, so was that during his um, period of time when he uh, was in trouble with the police and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, it was coming out of it. That was sort of my job in Los Angeles for years. Like when people kind of got down, they call me and I'd come in and we work on a bunch of stuff and music, and then usually their next project was the one that blew them up. So I did that with Mariah Carey. I did that with Robert Downey Jr., Malcolm Jamal Warner, a, a whole bunch of artists I did that with. Mariah so, Carey? Mm, yeah, I was with Mariah Carey for years. Wow. Mm. And what were you doing? Were you sort of, was it like a mentor thing or? Well, it was, it was sort <laughs> of all of it. Like I was uh, sort of the music director for all of these bands, and then I was you know, the best friend on site for things to just kind of be there. And um, with Mariah, I wrote, you know, my biggest songs are the songs I wrote with her. I've got my, my, you know, my only number ones were with her. Mm. And uh, yeah, so yeah, Joss Stone, all, all those people. Like I just, I ended up being with them when they were in need of a little Lionel love. Just like with my dad, you know, when he got sick and he needed somebody, I, I showed up. I was there to, to do the gig, you know. What was your favorite memory of the 2002 Super Bowl? Oh man, just honestly, that it was such a crazy time for me. I mean, that was, you know, that was the whole world was going crazy, and uh, for me, writing that arrangement was was very special, you know. And having the Boston Pops play it and Mariah sing it, I mean, it was just it was it was just very powerful for me, you know. Like uh, I felt like I was able to add something to the general world collective that was kind and heartfelt and loving and uh, I, I just feel really really lucky that I was able to do that and be a part of such a beautiful event you know right after 9-11 like it's the biggest event right after 9-11 you know it's I can't remember how many billion people watched it it was pretty insane so that was it was it was intense man being there on the stage in the stadium around all those presidents I guess my favorite moment was uh after the, after we did it, right, and I'm sitting in the box or whatever, and at halftime, Paul McCartney performed, right? And when he got done performing, he came up to me. <laughs> and, I mean, I don't know about you, but Paul McCartney's, you know, and he 
he, he came up to me and he goes, hey man, I just want you to know that what you're doing is beautiful and meaningful and you should be super proud of yourself. Awesome. And like for him to say something like that to me, like for no reason, just because it just was, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. It was really, it was really special. Totally. I mean, not every, uh, it's not something that a musician would experience in their lifetime. Um, that's that, that particular Super Bowl, any Super Bowl, I guess, to perform at is quite significant. Um, and like you say, uh, coming out of uh, the 2001, which was quite a heavy sort of period of time, um, and the first year, sort of the first year of uh, uh, the conflict in uh, in in Iraq and, uh, and and the things that were exploding around that, um, the world we haven't seen the world changed quite considerably since that time. That was the end of the twentieth century, and now we're in the twenty first century. That was the marker, wasn't it? Really, that we were in. It really was. It was huge, man. It's sort of like the same effect happened to the world that the pandemic had on the world, essentially. You know, and it was just like three or four months after 9-11 that I was doing that thing. So it was like, it was just a whole nother space, man. It was a whole nother space. And again, I, I can't express to you how how proud I am just to be a part of that. Nat King Cole was the first African-American to also uh, perform on American television as a uh, colored person. Is that correct? Well, he was my uncle and he was the first black man to ever have a television show. Yeah. He was the first black man to ever have a radio show. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he he changed history, Nat. I mean, he he was he was the bee's knees, you know. And because of him, so many doors have opened for so many people, not just people of color, but people all over. Because I think Nat played to a kind of pan-cultural audience. You know, everybody sort of found something to love in Nat King Cole. Because there was a lot to love inside of him. Yeah, and that was what in the late fifties that he had that program. Yeah, it was the uh, the fifties was the was when the show, when the show came up. He died in sixty four. So. Okay, so in that period of time, segregation was still happening in the South of America, wasn't it? It was an ugly time, man. Yeah. It was an ugly time. It was an ugly time, and to see, I mean, even that they took a chance on the show during that time, just kind of as a testimony to how big he was, how how much reach and power his uh, his presence had over the world at the world at large. I mean, because you know, television America was television. That was it. That's it. That was your medium. That was what everyone tuned into, and that was yeah. the messages that you were getting. And um, so it was a variety show, wasn't it? it? Was a music variety show? Yeah, music and comedy, and yeah. I mean, it it was it was a vaudevillian, mm. you know. But it was it was quite lovely. It's 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 an amazing. It was an amazing show, actually. Because around that time, you know, African Americans like Little Richard, for instance, um, when they would uh, like when he would release Tutti Fruity or any songs like that. Uh, Cole was it Cole Porter or um, what was the guy's name? It was a Pat Boone. Ah. Who would cover his songs. Right away. And, and Pat Boone would get two dollars. For every sale, and uh, Little Rich would only get a dollar for the sale. Do you know when that changed? When that became equal? Well, I, I can't say that it's ever become equal. It, it hasn't. Okay. There, there's there's an an inequity within most arts when it comes to gender and race. You mm. know, but um, you know, in the six in the late sixties, around sixty eight, when things changed and everybody got shot, things got a little better. You know what I mean? The Voting Rights Act came up and that was a really big deal. And, you know, uh, there, there became more representation in, in the in the legal forums of America. And that was a really big deal. Um, but it, it, it's I mean, unfortunately, we live in a world that that continues to find a way to polarize itself. Right now, we polarize ourselves by vaxxers and anti-vaxxers. But, you know, it's just sort of the way of things. And um my, I'm just glad that my family and me, we've all been really forward thinking and, and trying to move past those, things. trying to just stand for something that's beyond race, beyond gender, you know, beyond classism, you know, because the moniker of Nat King Cole is a socio kind of figment, you know, and and that people consider that royalty is is amazing. So I just 
try to be a good shepherd of that royalty and, you know, just continue to put as much positive energy in the universe as I can. Absolutely. And uh, how did you end up in Australia? Well, uh, at the time, I was playing drums with Ricky Lee Jones, drums and uh, keys and guitar. I was her multi-instrumentalist. And uh, we were playing all over the world, of course. And we got to the Sydney Opera House. And uh, she decided that that night she wanted me to play drums and keys and sing all at the same time to end a song. And so I did it. And I, I got the standing ovation or whatever. And she comes out, you know, afterwards and she gets on the mic and she says, hey, that's Lionel Cole from Chicago. I'm from New York, but that's OK. And she goes, you know, he's great, isn't he? And, and everybody kind of goes, yeah. And she goes, it's not his show, right? <laughs> and she freaks out, right? And in the audience was uh, my, my uh, how do you say that? My last wife. Um, and uh, she was like uh, in, in management for the opera house. And she, uh, she saw that go down and, and, you know, everybody got a little freaked out. And then she turned to me and Ricky says, Okay, Lionel, if you're so great, and of course she used other choice language with that, of course, um, then you sing the next song. So she made me sing one of her songs. I did it. I got another ovation. She kicked me off the stage. Uh, I'm sitting in the back looking at Sydney from the Opera House backstage going, this is a great place to get fired. Like this is, I mean, if you're going to get fired, if you're going to go out, you know, you might as well go out big. And uh, this little girl came up to me and started talking to me and you know, we had a midnight tour of the uh, opera house and spent 10 lovely years together before a parting come. Wow, that's amazing. So yeah. so you actually did, um, or was asked to leave the band that night? Yeah, I, I, I got asked back for Melbourne and we did Melbourne and uh, she had another sort of tantrum in Melbourne and I left the band. I was not uh, going to continue to take that kind of uh, spirited uh discussion let's say well you know artists can be a little bit um what's the word uh temperamental at times at the best of times you know but uh what i found though with with, with a lot of artists and I, you can correct me if you think i'm wrong but um you know i've worked with a lot of uh contemporary musicians yep. i've worked with jazz musicians and i've worked with blues musicians all genres and I'd have to say that the jazz musicians are the most humble people that I've ever come across um, because they're incredibly talented but yet so, uh, then, you know, their, their ego is so little, you know, the ones that I've come across anyway, you know, and it's been really easy to work with them, you know. Yeah, I would agree with you. And and before we move on, I got to say, I mean, Ricky Lee Jones is still one of my favorite artists in the whole wide world. I mean, she and and to me, she classifies closer to jazz like Joni Mitchell than the pop, you know, but I think it's really difficult for uh, a, a female in the music business as she gets of age to try to hold their own, you know, and any kind of thing that holds a candle next to it would be kind of horrifying, you know, when you're, cause it's really hard for a woman to age gracefully in this business. You know? so, I mean, I, I totally understand where she was coming from. And as far as jazz musicians go, I mean, I grew up thankfully in, in my family, the, the, the Pantheon was always around us. And I think some of the humbleness comes from, you know, everybody had to play for mobsters, you know, and it's awfully hard to get a big ego when, you know, Joy Bananas is sitting next to you, you know? It's like, you got to be a nice guy, you know, you got to figure out how to put your ego in your pocket, you know, you know, you don't want the drum roll to be the end of your life, you know what I mean? So um, tell us about your experience of working on The Voice, because that was a different thing altogether, wasn't it? Oh, uh, The Voice was funny, man. Um, I, I had no intention to do any of that stuff, but they approached me and they asked me if I would be interested. And I thought, because in this world, it's really difficult to, to get publicity, to be quite honest. And I thought, OK, well, this is a pretty perfect way to, to introduce myself to Australia. And I had no idea that so many millions of people would be into it even this many years later, you know. Um, but thankfully, you know, it was it was it was good fun. And were um, you serenading Kylie Minogue? Was that Kylie that you were serenading or? Yeah. So there's there's a. Um, 
there's sort of a fight in the beginning with Ricky and Kylie and I chose Ricky and then Kylie got upset and then, and then they came around and then I chose Kylie, you know, but, uh, but yeah, it was cool. Kylie really felt me and Ricky felt me and Will I Am was really cool and felt me. And I just, I, it was, it was good fun. It's funny. Cause you know, Will used to be in a band that used to open up for a band I was the lead singer in. And then we broke up and they got famous. And so, you know, it was pretty hilarious to like run into him so many years later, you know, but, yeah, man, it was it was a good experience, man. The people at The Voice, they, they know what they're doing, you know, and uh, and it was and it was good fun. I, I must admit, I probably would have never chosen to sing that song, but, you know, they knew their marketplace and what would stick. And because of me not being a douchebag and listening to what I was told, uh, I've, I've gathered a lot of fans around and, and I'm really thankful. When I, I'm, I've never watched The Voice, to be honest with you. I've only seen the clips um, and I looked at your clip uh, that, that, just to see what the deal was, you know. And, um, and I thought I've had a number of people on this podcast who have actually performed on The Voice or Australian Idol or something like that. And it's the new medium, for, like you say, to get any publicity, you sort of got to sell your soul to whatever medium that you can do to get some publicity but did, were you were able were you able to um gain any further uh publicity from the voice but did it actually brought your public it did pub, it did broaden your publicity yeah absolutely profile, sorry absolutely it, it was absolutely a it was it was a juggernaut for publicity for me uh, especially because, you know, I spent so much time with really giant artists, mostly in the back, you know, so, and, you know, I was a, I was a coach on the first season of American Idol because my long-term writing partner was Randy Jackson, you know, and we, we've been writing partners for almost 30 years. And um, so, yeah, so it was, it was interesting to be at, be at it from a uh, performer's point of view, as opposed to a mentor's point of view. And uh no matter how it shakes out, no matter how people do, it really is a great way for an audience to get to know you. You know, I'm, I'm really thankful for my time at The Voice. It was, it was good. So this is an odd one. What was your involvement with the Brady Bunch movie? <laughs> so I was the music supervisor and, uh, and I was also the music editor. And I wrote a song or two that were in there, uh, a rap song that I was rapping called I'm Your Monster. And uh, it was really good fun. At the time, I was a staff composer and music editor with Steve Tyrell. And he had a really big kind of music production firm. And, you know, it was it was good fun, man. It's a great, that's actually a really great movie. And it really, it helped launch my career as a film composer. I've composed for maybe 12 or 13 films and a couple of TV series and stuff like that. And it all comes from that time with Steve Tyrell. So what's your um, strength in terms of uh, playing music? Is it piano? Is it your voice? Is it drums? Is it, what? where's your, if you, if you had to say one instrument, what, what do you sort of lean to? If you, just to, just to, as out of enjoyment that you would just go to, that's your first go-to instrument. I think what I attempt to do, man, is to be a great accompanist whether I'm singing or playing an instrument or just being on the stage, you know, my, my, my goal is to lift up those around me as high as possible. And so it really doesn't matter what the instrument is or the medium or the genre. My goal is to just lift, even if I'm, you know, the star of the night, my goal is to lift the band stand up, you know what I mean? And to try to, encourage everyone who's participating in the show you know audience you know uh, people in the in the the wait staff the you know what i mean the the box office people whoever they are to just enjoy us all trying to raise the energy as high as possible so yeah i i i think i'm the last of a dying breed i, I believe in being a great accomplice oh yeah totally but when you're at home, that's what I mean, like in your own solace, you know, is there a particular instrument that you would just go to just, you know, whatever, for whatever reason? Like just... What, well, in the room, there are guitars you're and song? pianos and basses and drums. And, and I, I mean, I, I, I made so much time of my life on the piano, you know, and uh, and that was a lovely... It's a, it, The piano means a lot to me, you know. 
and uh, singing means a lot to me. Yeah, I mean, I was a classical voice major in college, so it's um, I, I just I just love music. The, like I love music so much, it, it it just courses through me like I don't know, like the north wind, and whatever direction it blows me is the direction I'm happiest in. Yeah, totally. Not to be, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to obfuscate or anything. I'm just I, I really all I can tell you is that I, I'm lucky enough that the music of the spheres talk, talks to me, you know, it actually reaches out and taps me on the shoulder. And whatever happens to be around when I get tapped is what I, what I'm really glad to grab, you know? Well, you're lucky you got that ability. Cause uh, I certainly don't have that sort of uh, talent. Come on now, man. <laughs> I'm on your show. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is different. Communicating between two people is different to being a multi-talented uh, musician, you know. It's all communication, man. But I'll tell you a story. The reason I'm in the music business and not anything else, my mom and dad were, were not really supportive of me being in the music business because I'm polysyllabic and I'm brown and, you know, I could be a lawyer or doctor, some stuff like that, right? But when I was a really little kid, I'd sneak out of bed and I'd crawl under the, the piano where my dad and the band would practice. And I would watch them go through songs without calling out what song it was, change feels without anybody doing anything. Just, I mean, I'm not talking arrangement stuff. I'm talking about just spontaneously, bang, everybody's there. And I thought to myself, I want to be around people who speak with their minds. And that's what music is. And to me, it's just a very high form of communication. And this is also a high form of communication. I don't believe in stratification, brother. I think that, you know, we, we are all pretty grand at the scheme of what we do. And, and they're all much closer related than unrelated. Well, that's all I've got for you today, Matt, in terms of questions. Awesome, man. Well, I hope uh, what I gave you is something that makes it useful. Cheers. See you, mate. Thank you very much. When voodoo strikes, it will tear apart your head. When voodoo strikes, you wish that you was dead. When voodoo strikes.